Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part 3 of the Minerals presentation. So before we go any further, let's quickly get the code word out of the way. The code word for this presentation is elephant, I repeat elephant, you know the, the big things, giant ears, long trunk. So once again that's elephant, please write it down, put it somewhere safe because you're going to need it for the code word quiz. Okay, so the next thing we can use to uh, to work out what our minerals are, are their hardness. And this is a, a very, very commonly used diagnostic feature. So when we are talking about the hardness of a mineral, we use the Mohs scale. And the Mohs scale is a scale that runs from one to 10. Obviously softest mineral is number one, hardest mineral is number 10. And it goes from one to 10, talc, gypsum, calcite, fluorite, apatite, orthoclase feldspar, quartz, topaz, corundum, diamond. So how do we work out you know, what the hardness is? Well, we use uh, a number of items which are commonly available to a geologist pretty much anywhere. So a fingernail, a copper penny, a steel nail, a glass plate, uh, typically a ceramic plate as well. Now, these items, obviously apart from the very, very difficult to find ones, are normally stuck in your field vest if you're a geologist and if you're going out and about and you want to try and work out what something is, you take those items with you and you can do a hardness test in the middle of nowhere because, you know, I think you can agree the equipment required is, is pretty simple. So, minerals like talc and gypsum will simply scratch with your fingernail. Uh, minerals with a hardness of three will scratch with a copper penny. Minerals with a hardness of four will be easily scratched by a steel nail, but not the copper penny or your fingernail. They're too soft. Minerals with a hardness of five will be scratched with a steel nail if you give it some serious effort. Minerals with a hardness of six will not be scratched by a steel nail. So they're too hard now. The steel nail is too soft. Minerals with a hardness of seven will scratch a glass plate. Minerals of a hardness of 6 will not scratch a glass plate, but minerals of a hardness of 7 will. And minerals of a hardness above 7 will be capable of scratching a ceramic plate, a streak plate, but minerals of a hardness of 7 will not be able to scratch a streak plate. Now when it comes to topaz, corundum and diamond, well you can see that you know if you want to you know, test for test for corundum, it will scratch every single mineral but diamond. So, you know, you're not going to be walking around with a huge diamond in your pocket. So when it comes to uh, working out the hardness of minerals at eight and above, it gets a little bit more tricky. But minerals one to seven, uh, sorry, hardnesses one to seven are, you know, are doable quite easily with equipment that you can pretty much take anywhere. It also helps that the vast majority of minerals will fall somewhere in between one and seven on the hardness scale. Now, one of the other diagnostic features we can use is cleavage. So cleavage is the tendency of a mineral to split along a specific uh, crystallographic structural plane. So what it means is it means there's a weakness in your mineral and your mineral will preferentially split along that weakness. Now, when it comes to cleavages, we typically, number one, we note how many there are because there can be up to six of them. And we also say how good they are, you know, when the mineral splits along the cleavage plane, does it leave a nice smooth surface? Or when the mineral splits along the cleavage plane, does it leave a kind of rough surface? Okay, so when it comes to cleavages, there's basal, cubic, octahedral, rhombohedral, prismatic, and dodecahedral. So that's one cleavage, three cleavages, four, three, two, six. And so a basal cleavage will typically be one cleavage orientated parallel to a crystal face. So it'll look like a stack of paper and you'll normally be able to split the mineral along that cleavage. Cubic minerals, well, you'll have three cleavages intersecting at 90 degrees and that will give your mineral quite a, a cuby look. Octahedral, typically you'll have four cleavages which intersect approximate and approximately consistent angles. And that will often result in crystals that have a, a pyramid-like appearance to them. Rhombohedral, well, it's three cleavages again, but they'll intersect at angles of, well, angles are, you know, greater than or less than 90 degrees. Okay, so they cannot intersect at 90 degrees. 
So that's the difference. Cubic, they will intersect at 90 degrees. Rhombohedral, they will not intersect at 90 degrees. Same number of cleavages, though. Prismatic is two cleavages typically running parallel to the mineral's elongation. And then we have dodecahedral, which I've left blank because, well, there aren't that many do do dodecahedral minerals out there, to be honest. And it's a bit difficult to actually define what it looks like. But, you know, luckily, there are some pictures in the next slide, so we'll be able to actually see visual um, visual evidence of what each one looks like. So when it comes to cleavages, we typically you know define them as perfect, good, or no cleavage. Okay, so in the case of a perfect cleavage, your mineral will split along one of these cleavage planes. The cleavage plane itself is easily visible, and when the mineral separates along it, it will leave a nice smooth surface. In the case of a good cleavage plane, once again, the cleavage plane will be visible. The mineral will separate along the cleavage plane, but the, the surface it leaves behind will not be super smooth. It will have some residual rough patches to it. Then the other end of the scale, we simply have no cleavage. And in that instance, when you try and you know, split a mineral that has no cleavage, it won't split along a cleavage plane. Obviously, it will fracture. So you'll end up with a broken, rough, uneven surface. So let's run through the types of cleavages. Okay, let's start with basal cleavage. So one cleavage. And you can see, here we go, you have layers of mineral stacked one on top of another. So it gives an appearance kind of like a stack of paper. And you can see that here with this muscovite crystal. You can see the layers one on top of another on top of another. You can also see that when you peel the layers away, look if you just look at this area here, look how smooth the surface is. So when you peel these sheets off along the cleavage plane, it leaves behind a wonderfully smooth surface. So this would be defined as one perfect cleavage. Now in terms of prismatic cleavages, okay, we have two cleavages that will intersect at 90 degrees. Now we can see them here. So we have one cleavage in yellow and the other cleavage is picked out in pink. So you can see the yellow cleavage are running like so, whilst the pink cleavages are coming in at 90 degrees. And it gives the mineral a very, very distinct stepped appearance. Okay. Now, in most cases, when we look at the, the third face, so this face of the crystal right here, it will typically be rather uneven and will not have that nice stepped appearance you get on the other faces. So you can see that these faces have the cleavage. Once again, it's quite a good cleavage there. You can see it's a nice smooth surface. And you can see this nice stepped appearance, which is telling us we have two cleavages intersecting at 90 degrees. When it comes to cubic minerals, we're going to have three cleavages intersect at 90 degrees. And that's going to produce a mineral that has a, you know, a cube-like appearance. And so if we look at this, uh, these crystal, this crystal of halite here, well, you can quite clearly see the cubes, can't you? And if you look at this crystal right here, so there's one cleavage plane. So this face here is a cleavage plane. This face here is another cleavage plane. And this face here is the other. And you can see that each of the cleavage planes are intersecting together at 90 degrees right there. In terms of rhombohedral cleavages, well, once again, we have three cleavages. So you can see it on this face here. We have the, the face that we're looking at. That's one cleavage plane. We have this surface along here. That's another cleavage plane. And we have this surface right here, that's the third. So we have one cleavage plane facing us, two is this flat surface right here, and three is this flat surface right here. But you'll notice though, it's not forming nice cubes like the cubic cleavage over here. It's actually forming slightly offset cubes. And that's because the cleavages are not meeting at 90 degrees. Octahedral cleavages will typically result in uh, crystals that have a pyramid-like appearance to them. In this case, this particular crystal actually has a, a double uh, termination on it. Okay, So you can see we've got one cleavage plane here, and this is the same cleavage plane over here. We have this cleavage plane right here, which is going to be this cleavage plane right here as well. Because remember, they're running parallel to each other, so they're the same cleavage plane. We have this cleavage plane right here, which is actually going to be on the back side of the crystal. You can't see it. And we have this cleavage plane up here, which is going to be on the back side of the top of the crystal over here. So you have four cleavages, and they all come together to produce this triangular pyramid-like termination. And then finally, we have uh, minerals with a dodecahedral cleavage. So in the case in the case of a mineral with dodecahedral cleavages, you will have six face. You'll have six cleavage planes. Uh, as you can see here, now I've, I must—I will be honest—I've cheated slightly. 
This is a garnet crystal. Garnet is actually part of the cubic crystal system, but um, just to kind of show you what a mineral or a dodecahedral cleavage would look like, I, uh, I put it up here. And you can see that what you would end up with is a crystal that typically will have a very uh, spherical kind of shape to it. The crystal will naturally take on this kind of, you know, mixture of diamonds and uh, in some cases, you know, other shapes like hexagons and pentagons all put together. You know, the faces will have different numbers of uh, <clears throat> edges to them. And they'll all lock together, though, to produce a shape that's somewhat spherical in its form. Just to be clear, dodecahedral minerals are relatively rare. So, you know, the chances of you ever coming across one are quite low. Okay. Now, if your mineral doesn't have cleavage and you try and make it break, it's just going to fracture. Now, fracture, on the whole, doesn't tell us a whole lot, but it does give us some information about the mineral. Occasionally, when a mineral fractures, it will fracture in a very, very distinctive way. So, the common types of fracture which we see are, co are conchoidal fracture. And this is when you end up with a curved breakage that kind of resembles the concentric ripples of a mussel shell. I'll show you a picture in the next slide which will kind of make that clearer. We have an earthy fracture that looks like freshly broken soil. We have what's called a hackley fracture where you get jagged, sharp, uneven surfaces. That's very common with native metals, especially copper. You have a splintery fracture and that tends to occur where you have a mineral that's very, very fibrous. And then you have simply an uneven fracture, and that's when your mineral breaks, and it doesn't show any of these distinct uh, fracture surface types, and so you just simply say, right, well, that's just an uneven fracture. So here we go. Here's a nice conchoidal fracture. You can see the shape of it there, and you can see these concentric lines in the fracture, which look like a mussel shell. Conchoidal fracture is very commonly associated with mineral quartz especially, but it can turn up in other minerals like olivine. In terms of an earthy fracture, we can see that just here. If you were to crack this uh, hand specimen of uh, limonite open, what would you get? Well, you would get a surface that looks like this. It's very dull, earthy, and uneven. Splintery fractures, what you can see here, here we have some asbestos. Asbestos is a very fine fibrous mineral. You know, you can see each one of these very fine crystals is one crystal. And essentially as it splits, it, it begins to kind of, you know, almost come off a bit like cotton wool for want of a better way of describing it. Hackley fractures, you can see this very, very uneven edge along here. Okay. That's a Hackley fracture, as I say, it's most commonly associated with native metals, especially copper. And then we have the most common type of fracture, which is an uneven fracture. And that's just literally when the mineral just breaks. Okay, If it doesn't have any of these distinct distinctive appearances to it, you would just classify it as an uneven fracture. And the vast majority of minerals have uneven fractures. So most of the time, fracture isn't particularly useful. But sometimes conchoidal fractures, hackley fracture, and even earthy fracture does give you some information. Uneven fracture doesn't really tell you very much at all because there are lots of minerals that have uneven fractures. Now, then we have specific gravity. So now uh, specific gravity is not very effective uh, as the vast majority of common minerals have a, a specific gravity of between 2 and 3.5. And your sense of touch isn't refined enough to tell the difference between you know that range. However, specific gravity is useful for minerals that are high in transition metals. So you know minerals that contain a lot of iron and other heavy minerals like lead. And the problem with those ones is the vast majority of those minerals can be more quickly identified using other diagnostic features okay but nevertheless they are noticeably heavy when you put them in your hand you feel the weight of them and that's because there's so much so many tran you know so much transition metal within them now specific gravity really becomes most useful when you actually have a mineral that looks like another type of mineral so for instance shelite which is a which is a very common tungsten mineral it's 
pretty nondescript to be honest you know go on to if you go on to uh onto google and just type in she light you'll get a whole load of you know pictures of crystal of uh, of rocks with she light in it and you'll think uh, that's rather unspectacular it typically looks kind of a kind of white peachy color looks a bit like a feldspar almost however because it has tungsten in it it's going to naturally be very, very heavy. Specific gravity of 5.9 to 6.1. That's much heavier than most other silicate minerals. So when you pick it up, you really feel the weight of it. And so that's an instant indicator that you're not dealing with something like a feldspar. You are, in fact, dealing with a mineral like shelite. So it does have its uses sometimes. The most common use of uh, specific gravity when it comes to geology and geology-related fields is uh, in the gem industry. And it's especially useful in the diamond industry because diamond has a specific gravity of 3.5, whereas cubic zirconium has a specific gravity of 5.6 to 6. And so that means if you're worried that you might be being sold fake diamonds, which are in fact cubic zirconium, you simply weigh them. And for a set diameter of a diamond, you should know, you know, you should know what the weight is. And if it weighs too much, well, clearly you're being sold cubic zirconium instead of diamond. The final thing is streak. Now, streak is most effective with the uh, metallic minerals. Okay. Now, when you streak them, what we have is a situation where we're powdering the crystal as we drag it across this thing here. This thing here is a ceramic streak plate. Now, most opaque and colored minerals will give some kind of streak, but it's the opaque minerals, the minerals that light won't pass through, the metallic minerals, which are best when it comes to streak. So when we look at a crystal, the crystal lattice or impurities may cause a mineral to display one color. Now the thing is, is because when you look at a crystal, the um, unit cell is orientated in a nice consistent fashion, it displays a nice consistent color. It, the, the crystal all looks the same. However, as you drag that crystal across the streak plate, what happens is, is tiny little bits of it flake off onto the streak plate. Now this means that what you end up with are lots and lots of fragments of crystal which are all randomly orientated. And so this means the light doesn't, doesn't react with them in, you know, in, in a consistent fashion. And so this means that you can have a crystal like here that looks this kind of you know, deep grey metallic mineral which is hematite. <clears throat> and you can see it's kind of you know, pretty black grey in colour. But when you drag it across the streak plate here what you end up with is a streak that's red brown and that's simply because as you drag it across you're powdering the mineral and that means the way the light is you know reflecting off the crystals produces a completely different color and this is a very very helpful diagnostic feature especially for metallic minerals so if we look here here's a range of uh, very common metallic minerals and here's a few picked out so hematite the color of the streak is a dark brown color. So it's, so it's just a hematite itself will typically have a color that ranges from dark brown to steel gray to almost black. But the streak itself will be a very strong rust red color. Then we have pyrite, which will give you a brass yellow streak. Well, give you, sorry, give you a brass, it has a brass yellow color and it'll give you a black streak. Magnetite, which is typically black in color, will give you a black streak, so not always helpful. Galena, Lead grey in colour will give you a kind of grey black streak, and copper, unsurprisingly, will give you a copper red streak. So sometimes the streak is actually quite helpful, and sometimes it's not. But when it is, you know, when it you know, when it actually is helpful, it's really helpful. What are the other useful diagnostic features out there? Well, magnetism. There are only really two common magnetic minerals. One of them is magnetite. The other one is pyrotite. There are other minerals which are, you know, weakly magnetic, but when it comes to minerals which are strongly magnetic, there's just two of them. And they're pretty easy to separate out. Magnetite is grey black in colour. Pyrotite is a kind of bronze yellow in colour. Done. Then we have effervescence. Does it react with hydrochloric acid? If it does, it's a carbonate. If it doesn't, it's not a carbonate. So you should note that different acids will dissolve different minerals. However, 
when geologists talk about effervescence we are normally referring to hydrochloric acid because that's the standard acid of a geologist that's what we take out into the field with us next is exolution now exolution is the result of one mineral essentially for want of a better way of describing it sweating out of another and it will often result in textures which are very very variable but the one particular type of uh, exolution where we're particularly concerned about is something called pathetic texture and pathetic uh, texture is a diagnostic feature for the mineral microcline feldspar also referred to as potassium feldspar so here we go so here's a, a crystal of microcline feldspar and you'll notice that it has this rather wormy appearance to it same with this crystal of amazonite here now this is a variety of microcline same mineral different color and once again you can see you have these you know wiggly lines running through the crystal if we look at it at a microscopic level once again here's the microcline in the dark gray and here's the other mineral here in these lighter gray crystals now the other mineral is a mineral called albite so what we have here is we have a mixture of two minerals so you know where does this texture come from well the the pathetic texture is the result of the microcline and the albite being able to completely melt into each other dissolve into each other at temperatures above 700 celsius so if i take this crystal to temperatures above 700 celsius the albite and the microcline will just begin to dissolve into each other and it will produce one crystal which has a mixed composition between the two now as that crystal cools down and goes below 700 if it cools down slowly enough what happens is is the albite will begin to sweat out of the microcline the potassium feldspar and it will essentially begin to sweat out and it will form these wiggly bands which all run parallel to each other because they're exploiting cleavage and so what you end up with is you end up with a potassium feldspar crystal which has these wiggly lines in it and it's very very diagnostic of a particular type of potassium feldspar which is called microcline feldspar and so um, exolution is actually very very common it's a very common uh, geologic feature uh, however you know when it comes to identifying minerals for you guys you know the only time you're really going to see it is in microcline feldspar The final diagnostic feature we can use is something called twinning. Now, twinning is the result of two different crystals of the same mineral which share some uh, crystal lattice points. So you're thinking, what is he talking about? Well, if we look at, let's look at this crystal right here. Now, this crystal is being looked at down a microscope and there's something called a polarizer being used. So it's giving the crystal a fake color. But what you can see is you have this half of the crystal is taking on this kind of light gray color and this half of the crystal is taking on a medium gray color now this means that they must be different crystals because if they were all the same crystal it would give a uniform color but it doesn't it gives two separate colors therefore they're two separate crystals and so this boundary here is the contact between them so what have we got going on here well in this situation what we have is we have two separate se uh, separate crystals which are growing right next door to each other and the thing is is the crystal lattices of these crystals are nearly perfectly aligned and so as these two crystals start growing what happens is is because the crystal lattices are so so well aligned they actually start to meld into each other and so what happens is you have these two crystals which will grow independently of each other but if you look at the crystal itself and you don't have these you know special things like polarizers it will just look like one crystal okay and that's all that twinning is it's just two crystals right next door to each other which as they grow their crystal lattices are so you know well or you know they're, 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 the organization of them is so close to one another that they just lock into each other okay so each one so i should have said by the way each of these is the same mineral and so the crystal lattice you know on for this mineral here is aligned almost perfectly to the crystal lattice of this mineral here so they can just lock into each other very very easily 
Now, twinning can get a little bit more extreme and complex. So twinning is most noticeable in the mineral plagioclase feldspar. So this is what it looks like. Now, this is a particularly good example, but this is what it can look like in hand specimen. When you, and this is what it can look like down in microscopes. You'll see you get these very, very distinct parallel bands. Now, this is what I say down in microscope. This is what it looks like in hand specimen. And you get all of these twins all running parallel to each other. And you'll notice, once again, though, it's just two crystals. So you have one crystal, which is kind of giving you this blue-gray. And you have another crystal, which is kind of giving you this gray-black color. And so just two different crystals intergrown with one another, producing this very, very distinctive appearance where you have all these twins all running parallel to each other. So the question is, is you're thinking to yourself, well, hold on a minute. How do I work out what's a twin and what is a cleavage plane? Well, the answer is, is when your mineral splits, it will not split cleanly along the, the twinning plane. So if I was to split this mineral along this plane right here, it would give a very, very messy, uneven surface. Okay, so it wouldn't look it wouldn't you know look like a good cleavage plane at all. Same with these twins here. If I try to break this crystal along this twin here, it would just give a highly irregular surface. So it wouldn't look like a cleavage plane. So that's how we tell the difference. Now, this particular type of twinning where we have all these very, very fine twins all running parallel to each other is a very good diagnostic feature of plagioclase feldspar and it's called polysynthetic twinning. And so if, when we see twinning like this, the first mineral that we always think of is plagioclase feldspar. Now, there are other minerals which can have it. Minerals like uh, calcite, calcium carbonate, can also have it, but it's, not, but it's often not quite as extreme as the type of polysynthetic twinning you get in mineral well in the mineral plagioclase feldspar. Okay, everybody, so that's it for the minerals. So you're gonna to have to uh, please take note of what we've just discussed in uh, part two and part three, because you're going to need that when it comes to the lab portion where we identify some minerals. All right, have a good day, everyone.